And so it goes. Welcome to Not Just Any Book Clubs episode. And Kurt Vonnegut, specifically Slaughterhouse Five or The Children's Crusade. We're going to just shorten it to Slaughterhouse Five. Um, I'm Justin. I'm me, and this is my co host, Pierce. We both yes, read the same true. book. Um, Facts. The semi autobiographic science fiction infused anti war novel. Um, it's a dark comedy. It's science fiction. It tells the stro- um uh, kind of like the story of someone in from World War II, um, out of order because he got abducted by aliens, um, and now he experiences himself unstuck in time. Very interesting novel. Um, all things considered, um, it it is just um one of the more interesting pieces of literature uh, from this era. This era of uh, just like going anti-war i think this is written around vietnam so the vietnam mm-hmm. war at least so who wants to uh do a little bit of a rundown of just like it doesn't have to be in order or out of order because this book is told out of order anyway so mm-hmm. however you want to do it um i guess i could go ahead and, and do a little bit of a rundown uh in in this book you don't actually start out with the main character you start out with uh the author of the book that our main character is in um because the main character is a fictional it, even in the book it's a fictional person uh named billy pilgrim who is a man unstuck in time he served in world war Two. Um, he got sent to the Battle of the Bulge, and he barely made it out alive. Um, he doesn't really like fighting, also. He doesn't no. want to fight in the war. Um, uh, it's a, it's kind of like around here, in the aftermath of the Battle of the Bulge, that we first like really see his like being unstuck in time, and it jumps around a little bit, but just to go in order for, for uh, ease of retelling it, um he uh he then gets captured by some Germans following the battle um and they are transported into Germany um he goes through a couple other things like there's a camp that uh, some British people are running in in behind Germany German lines um they they're like kind of running it it was my understanding they're like they they're not like affiliated with or they're they're like the oldest prisoners or something i wasn't really understanding what their exact position was that they were like running this camp but um, um there were some british people kind of in charge of the first camp he went to after he was captured hmm that is I guess I forgot that detail. Yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. Um there was also that guy that was kind of a jerk as well. Yeah, and there was like a there was like a play and stuff or whatever there where all the like men were different. Yeah. Um anyways, after that, uh he gets transported to Dresden into the titular Slaughterhouse Five, where he's staying. Um and he survives the famous fire bombings of Dresden by um going underneath slaughterhouse five with also some german guards um uh after following this and ve day and all that he is honorably discharged and he is hospitalized because he obviously has ptsd um he's given psychiatric care uh and he shares a room with uh, a man who introduces him to Kilgore Trout, a science fiction author, uh, who is real bad and not many people know about his work. Um, and then after his release, he marries one Valencia Marable, who he doesn't really like um, all that much. She is overweight. Uh, that's a fact that he mentions many, many times. Um, <laughs> And uh, because of her and her dad, mostly his her dad's connections, he becomes a very successful optometrist and becomes fairly wealthy. Um, they have kids together and a whole life, and he's successful. 
And then he is abducted by a flying saucer um, and taken to Tralfmador. And the Tralfmadorians are these four-dimensional beings who are um, able to see all points in time yeah. essentially throughout their lives. Like, yeah, they... they, just- they they the, they see their perspective of wherever they are on the timeline at all times. Basically, they just see death as just a moment. Like it's not anything right. big. It's just another fact. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they're living all of their other moments all at the same time. <laughs> they all they're always living every moment. Um, and that's kind of where the so it goes thing comes from. Um. Death means nothing, so the response to that is that's what happens. So it goes. So it goes. Yeah. Uh, And it is a response that Billy takes up, and so you see that many, many, many times throughout the book. Um, 106 times, to be exact. (laughs) But uh, on Tralfmador, Billy is put inside of a dome, and um, they want to they put him in there with a human female, and uh, he's supposed to mate uh, for their, I believe, for science. I thought it was uh, for a them. Zoo. Oh right, no, it was a zoo. Yes, it was like a yeah, like entertainment. Um, he eventually goes back to Earth after having a child with this. Uh, other woman, I believe she's like a actress or something, or a model, something I think like a that. Pornographic film star. Oh, yes. Um, Not just any actress. But so uh, he gets in a plane crash uh, later, um, a few years later, in Vermont, where um, on- only he and one other person survive. Um, when driving to visit him in the hospital, his wife crashes and dies of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and Billy discusses, uh, the bombing of Dresden with his new hospital roommate. The second time, second major time in his life, um, his hospital roommate is, is kind of a mean kind of a jerk and uh they they so they talk about dresden um billy's daughter takes him home and to her he seems to go a bit crazy but it's really at this point in his life he starts talking about uh the trout um and he seeks out kilgore trout and he kind of builds a relationship with him and he starts talking about the trout uh and his daughter thinks he's gone insane um, but he like he does stuff like he sneaks out and he goes to a radio show um, and he talks about that and uh, yeah eventually he becomes famous and is um, there's this big moment where he like he's he's given a speech at uh, a baseball stadium in Chicago in the future from when the book was written and. Um, uh, and he accurately predicts his own death, like moments before it happens. And he's like, "Death is but a moment. If you don't understand that, you haven't understand a w- understood a word I've said. Um, or if you think death is terrible, then you haven't understood a word I've said. But yeah, um, I mean that's basically the whole book. Uh, <laughs> yeah." Um... It, 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 I believe it ends with like the the ending because it's a lot of chronological order is like yeah it's like peace following the Dresden bombing yeah. like a moment of respite yeah um I I also yeah um you you, you did sum it up really good um really well um so I essentially just telling this entire life story it if you put it in order I think it even tells him of his birth right like. Um, he goes back mm-hmm. in time and sees him as a baby, uh, or we see him as a baby, and then he goes all the way to his death. Um, and basically, I think on up. Uh, also, 
I, I do want to say this. Vonnegut, this is my first Vonnegut novel. I mean, obviously, I think Pierce and I have expressed interest in reading other stuff by him. Mm-hmm. Mainly because um, all of his books are interconnected. Um, he writes that way just to make sure that um, like Kilgore Trout appears in other novels. And I believe this is the... Uh, this isn't the first one, but like this is considered like um, he gives you all the information you need. So essentially, you you won't be missing out on much of you. This is your first Vonnegut novel. Like we didn't miss out on much. Um, so characters appear. I don't think Billy Pilgrim appears anywhere, but I think the Tralfamadorians appear in other books. I can't say which ones. They appear in the short stories. It's essentially to make, um, it's supposed to make it like the world um that we inhabit. No one is the main character. There are many main characters in life. There's no such thing as a main character. So I think Vonnegut, by doing that um, and connecting it, almost like a comic book in a way, um, it's just supposed to show like how interconnected everyone is um, and how everyone has lived a life um, that is beyond the pages in, in the book that you're reading. Um, but we're only reading Slaughterhouse-Five right now and possibly other books. Um, mm-hmm. I do want to say that... Um, this was written before PTSD was considered a, a true mental diagnosis. Um, and people have been saying, I, I've seen some speculation, uh, I was online, that like that this is supposed to be taken like as a metaphor. Um, I, I'm more willing to take it as an allegory, not a metaphor, um, because um, a lot of the PTSD symptoms are mentioned as an he relives the memories as if he was actually there. And um, in the flashbacks, like I think the plane crash, um, I think they were going to an ophthalmology convention or something. Uh, He's fully aware um, in the moment and he knows that everyone's going to die, but he does not do anything to fight it. He doesn't warn anybody. He doesn't say anything. He just goes with it because he knows he's going to survive, which I'm assuming is very similar to the symptoms of PTSD, where essentially you are reliving that memory over and over again, and it feels real. Um, It's constantly playing back, and it feels like you could do something, but you can't, and it scares you. Um, So I think that's essentially, this is Mm -hmm. what a a giant allegory for. Um, And he does try to live his life, but he's unstuck in time, so he goes back and he can't really help but go back in time, maybe sometimes even see the future. So, yeah. That, That is my take on it. Um, I, I think it's there's too much detail about the interspersed about like the aliens for it to be just kind of all in his head, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you, you can have your own. You can have your own take on that. Yeah, um, I think that that's probably true. I mean, Kurt Vonnegut, I, he writes science fiction, so. Um, yeah. while you know the the greater there's a greater meaning of food for sure, it doesn't necessarily in the logic of the book preclude like the Trough Midorians not being real and him like just you know dealing with PTSD. Um, so like the you know he can be unstuck in time and it can also be like metaphorical or or, or symbolic yeah. of PTSD symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what did you think about the, um, the phrase, so it goes? Because at first, th- this is my experience with it. I mean, I, I, I knew this phrase was kind of ubiquitous among literature. Um, at first I was kind mm-hmm. of annoyed with it. And then I'm kind of, I started vibing with it. And then I'm like, oh, okay. I kind of get it. And then he kept on using it over and over again. And then I started to realize that how horrific, um, the war was obviously, and just like the amount of times that he says it, 106 times, um, and and the amount, the frequency that it happens, um, it, it is it is very shocking to see that yeah. be repeated many times. Well, I I I actually didn't didn't have any kind of um, thought along those lines. I think like its usage is interesting um, because it works on two levels as like, um, yeah, sure. Like the Trophimadorian philosophy might be a little bit correct. Maybe we take death a little bit too seriously, but then there's also like the amount of times it's used is insane. And, you know, you're just not supposed to not care 106 times. Um, there's like a, there's like a back and forth, uh, in, in the, what, 
in what Vonnegut is saying in using it um, by both kind of like giving credence to this, this Chalfmadorian philosophy and also being like, no, that's, that's a, that's an absurd amount of times to have written that in like 250 pages or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think that's, that's interesting that the, that just those three words being used over and over and over again can kind of be a massive part of the debate between these two, this like kind of postmodern fatalist ideology of, of the Charles Medorians and like kind of more of like our, the normal human moral ideology. Yeah. Um, I mean, that also goes with this prose. I, I know that you said that, um, but is holding back um, this book back from being like the perfect novel. And I, I do agree. Uh, but prose is kind of bare. Um, mm hmm. And sometimes it does work, like, again, so it goes yeah. repeated. Um, there is some irony in black humor. Um, I mean, you do see a little bit of the wit throughout. Um, and I'm assuming that he's one of those people that just, you know, doesn't want to focus too much on the prose. But, I mean, I thought it was too stripped back. Um, it, it did work some of its benefit. And I, I'm assuming, yeah. that, like, if you want to tell a joke, you don't want to overcomplicate things. But just, like, a bit more. Could it's been a little bit more. Um, yeah, I I think the thing, the thing that I say about it is like, as I'm reading the book, I understand how this is the book that gets a lot of people into literature. It's it's mm -hmm. a great book. It's a great story. There's a lot to chew on, uh, while also being fairly Fair. simply written. Yeah. Um, but it's. It's a, it's a little too too stripped back, like you said. Like if it if it wasn't so stripped back, like I would, yeah, I would say it's perfect, pretty much. I think I think yeah. um, that's that's the one kind of glaring issue for someone who is not reading this as a gateway classic. For someone who's reading this as like, okay, I've been reading classics for a while, and now I'm coming back, and it's almost too stripped back for me at this point. Um, whereas if I was reading this as, as like my, one of my gateways into classics, I think it would be perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not everyone. You can't, yeah. you know, can't yeah. write for, for, for that small group of people all the time. Yeah. Um, again, I mean, I, I did laugh a few times in the book, um, but it was more about the concepts rather than the, just like the actual sentences. I mean, seldom does a book actually make me laugh. Um, it's sad, mm -hmm. it, unless like your Terry Pratchett or Douglas Adams. I don't know. It, it's, it's just hard to capture wit onto a page, in my opinion. Um, as in the illicit laughter. Um, I mean, I didn't mind that much. But actually, um, what do you think about the... the I, I know I'm jumping back and forth because we're unstuck in time. Um, about the um, they say at the beginning of the book it's like um, when it, the author I think it's actually Kurt Vonnegut himself not like the actual stand-in uh, like him actually saying we should have um, the teapot um, someone dying for a teapot be the climax of this novel and at the very end it's barely even a sentence I think again I think the stripped back um, nature of how this is written works for its benefit because mm -hmm. you expect you know that being foreshadowed at the very beginning to be this grand thing that's going to be happening, but it's barely even mentioned. And I feel like that was obviously that was done intentionally, but it's supposed to show that damn, maybe not everyone's going to have their big hero moment. And this guy literally died over a teapot. Um, right, kind of just serves the purpose of like how arbitrary life can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there there are many other again. That's that's one small chasm of this entire thing, um, and the novel uh, about like how pointless um, war is, um, like yeah, I think um, even the prisoners um, they they all I don't I don't think there's much said about the nationality. It's just like I think that was kind of way a way for um, Vonnegut to be saying that it's pointless to be um, proud of your nation. We're sent for all this together, uh, and we're just fighting over. Well, not to say that World War II was fought over nothing. It's just like it's it's pointless to be proud of your country. It's just we're in almost literal hell essentially, and we're just there. 
we would just suffer. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, it, it's almost anticlimactic in a way. Intentionally so. Yeah. Um, what did you think about uh, what the bird song meant? It felt too, like... I wasn't sure what to get from it, but it felt very, like, pronounced to not mean anything. Like, very, um, like... He, yeah, pooty wheat. Oh, no. The poo, poo to wheat or whatever. Yeah, pooty wheat or something like that. Pooty wheat. Yeah. At the um, end. it was it was very. I I felt like it was very like. This is what we're saying right now. Like it's important, but I I wasn't able to get a read on why. Um, I don't know if birds make that noise either. I feel like that that's something. Right, and that's actually something that stands out. That makes it stand out even more. That obviously like. It's a weird way to to describe the way a bird uh, calls um, or sings. Yeah, she not, not. I don't know if that was unintentional or not. Um, I like to think that um, perhaps again. I think this is the way the novel ends. It's just like this happens right after the Dresden bombing, and then this beauty right afterwards, um, mm-hmm. showing that nature um, that we're all just part of nature or something like that. Um, nature, nature is exists. healing yeah um, even, <laughs> though, even though we bombed dresden um yeah like that um well it's way, also also done part of the way into like it it's done outside of a one of his hospital trips or something i think so um i don't remember exactly i don't think the details of that are important i think that um uh telegram was like he was well hidden i think he almost died though um, he was caught in like kind of in the middle of it, but he was able to survive death, not um because of just his location. I don't know if it was by luck or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially he was just there, and I think the bird being there, beauty. I'm guessing the bird was supposed to represent just, like the innocence of nature. Still appears on top of the rubble and says "pooty beat" and still. By the way, birds say that as a mating song, so he was looking to get mm-hmm. some action right after some bombing <laughs> happened. So essentially, I like to think that the um the bird represents just like the internet, the internet. Oh my god, beauty, nature, life persisting after the loss of a lot of life. And the numbers that were described um in the Dresden bombing were actually inaccurate because uh the guy, the historian that reported the numbers of the Dresden bombing, are um has to say that he has some interesting views about World War Two and what transpired. So it is a lot less than um, what the amount. It's still a lot of people. Are we talking about the? Are we talking about the real historical Dresden bombing, or or the historian that kind of a uh, you know had an interesting conclusion about the? Um, or are you talking events. about the historian who like actually like wrote about the bombing of Dresden, or are we talking? Yeah, about no, the... like okay, so. This story, I forgot who the historian was, but um, essentially, he was well respected for his time, and then he may have denied that a very unfortunate event uh, I see. happened mm-hmm. um, during World War II, and he's been discredited. David Irving, he's a giant anti-Semite, so um, yeah, it was in the book. It's one hundred thirty-five thousand, but the real number was closer to twenty-five thousand. Um, yeah, it, it's. It's an inflated number. Um, it it probably gets a false historical awareness. Whatever that is, um, it's it's something. Um, it 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 doesn't detract from the you know devastation. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm on Wikipedia right now. Actually, uh, after looking at that, the bird and uh, quote from Wikipedia. Um, the source footnote twenty nine. Oh, I guess it doesn't say anything. Um, throughout the novel, the bird sw- sings. Pooty wheat. Um, after the Dresden bombing, the bird breaks out in song. The bird also sings outside of Billy's hospital window. The song is a symbol of a loss of words. There are no words big enough to describe a war massacre. One part about symbols is that you can have multiple interpretations. Because I think my interpretation may be something. Um, mm-hmm. How life continues to persist, just like the bird will continue to try to get some action, even though a lot of people just died. 
I, I, I don't like to think that Vonnegut is um, diminishing the the devastation that happened. I obviously by saying try to sum it up as in um so it goes. And he's not saying that life will still keep on going on. So maybe my interpretation of that bird is perhaps maybe not the most inappropriate. Maybe not the most appropriate thing. Um, perhaps Wikipedia is right this time. Just this one time. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, it, it does kind of denigrate the entire thing to just be, it happens. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what, anything else you want to talk about? Um, do you think that, you know, he does describe the devastation of the war? Were you, did you feel, like, kind of devastated? Or, like, felt like the severity of just, like, the death toll happening? Because I, I think, uh, at least at the end, he does. Anyways. Yeah, I definitely felt the severity of, of the moment. Um, it was, like, yeah, considering all the skipping around, um, and the kind of an inevitability to like this is where we're headed like we're gonna eventually he's eventually gonna come back around to this and we're gonna see it um or read about it rather um uh, you know it's a lot it's a lot to build up and i feel like it 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 sticks it and really kind of shows us the horrific moment that's affected billy pilgrim for well, the rest of his life, but out of order mm -hmm. and all that. But um yeah, no, it definitely it definitely he definitely kind of sticks the Yeah. He's, horrifying nature of it. He's able to strike a balance with all the humor and the absurdity, obviously with all the aliens and stuff. Which I mean I thought that was really interesting. Like how he's able to um let all that happen and transpire and still have a dark sense of humor without um again um, diminishing the impact of the death toll and the war and everything, which well, it's it's interesting because it's a, there's like even in the the human zoo, there's very serious moments with between him and the um, mm -hmm. and the 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 actress um, <laughs> who they got to to uh, you know mate with him, um, even though all of the 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 aliens are played off as as humorous as funny uh most of the time um or at least in their differences between the way that billy thinks and the way that they think um even through that there's there's this very some very serious moments between the the two people in the zoo uh yeah. which i think is really interesting yeah um and I, I think that um he even goes out of his way to even say that glorifying war is foolish and wrong. Um like I think one of the characters just says, like, I've told my sons that they are not under any circumstances to take part in massacres, and that the news of massacres of enemies is not to fill them with satisfaction or glee. I have also told them not to work for companies that make massacre and machinery and to express contempt for people who think we need machinery like that. So I think Vonnegut is making his point very clear about the fact that war is hell. Um, which again, a lot of things, and I, I, I know that, um, it's kind of this famous quote that, that it's impossible to make an anti-war movie. Um, I think that also doesn't kind of apply to literature because like even describing war makes it exciting and makes more people want to do it. And I think this kind of does, um, in an, um, in a very interesting way, kind of avoids, skirts around that problem by not really describing combat. He more describes the after effects, like the aftermath mm -hmm. of it and how devastating it is. And again, um, he wants to invoke the response by saying, so it goes over and over again. Um, so I think that's very interesting uh, of them to be doing. Um, again, showing because war is hell. It shows the aftermath uh, of it um, and just like showing how it absolutely devastates the entire um, mind of people that um, experience it. And I think even the people that partake in war, like who, who is that guy, L Razzo, um, that says I, you know, there's revenge. I think he is a Nazi sympathizer. Um, and like he says, I'm going to kill you and your, fa uh, your family uh, when you least expect a Billy Pilgrim. So even the people um, that he's supposed to show camaraderie with um, are not mm -hmm. the nicest people either. So I think that's that's another way of um, looking at that. It's It's not glorious. So yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah. I feel I honestly feel like you summed that up pretty well. And I also don't want to get cut out by the internet again in the middle of something. Or another, yeah. I feel like I, I don't have anything else to say. I feel mm-hmm. like I, I'll definitely be reading more. I, I don't know if I'm going to be reading short stories by him. I feel like I'm going to read the novel and get really well into the verse, the universe, and just like, you know, because it does remind me of a comic book with characters interacting with other characters that may we never thought would have a crossover. There they are. Mm. So, yeah. I, I'm definitely going to read more Vonnegut. And, uh, and, you know, I took me a while to get around to Slaughterhouse-Five. I recommend getting around to it to anyone who, who hasn't yet. It's it's yeah. It definitely easy deserves read. the hype. Yeah, easy read. Although, I, you know, being someone who's read plenty of other classics to this point, I don't think it's it's a perfect book. It's it's definitely... Um, it's something special. It's, some, it's something very unique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like and a yeah. classic that doesn't, it's not really pretentious. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but it mm-hmm. takes itself seriously enough. Balance. Right. Yep. Um, and with that, uh, you can find us on Twitter or uh, TikTok at Not Just Any Pod. Um, you can join us next month for French literature. We'll be back to doing bookends. Um, we're watching Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Ooh. Um, so join us for that. Uh, we'll be back to doing bookends. We'll do that. And then um, I picked a really interesting book for that. So look out for that. Um, and uh, please give us a like rating, subscribe, follow, share, share. Our, our, <laughs> share our, our show. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and yeah. Um, uh, so it goes. Goodbye, Prometheus. All that jazz. You know me. <laughs>